I'm delighted here to uh, launch uh, these briefing papers and to, to allow you later to uh, look at the uh, Wolfson Lab. I'm going to start um, a bit like Al Gore, I suppose, with uh, some inconvenient truths. All right? These are things that are happening. Um, we may or may not like that they're happening, but they're happening, and how do we deal with them? And I think combined, this makes the principle technological and societal challenge for this century, which is we have a rising population, about 7 billion now, almost certain to be around 10 billion by the end of the century. Do we have enough energy even for people on the planet now and with the standards of living we have? Um, we are almost certainly beyond peak oil per person, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. And of course, we certainly want to maintain, and for many people, a perfectly legitimate desire to improve their standard of living. All of that an enormous challenge and climate change is there in the mix and a particularly difficult part of that mix because at the moment 80% of our energy is derived from fossil fuels. So I'm going to show just one graph which is my own analysis of the problem and then what it means for CO2. So what I have on this axis and these are the points is not oil production but oil production per person which is really what counts. How much oil do we have? Okay? And um, we're here. Actually, the peak oil per person was in 1979. Um, and this um, one barrel is about 160 litres, so you can multiply by five quite easily to see. You know, we've got about 800 litres per person um, per year. But that's for everything, not just for your car, your flights, everything that's manufactured, okay? So the reason why it's been flat is population's been rising by about 1 or 2% a year, as has oil production. What is the trend? Well, you can believe it or not. What I've done is I've simply done a simple growth equation, or Hubbard fit, to both population and oil. And it suggests that maybe we're on this downward trend. On, uh, on the right is something I'm uh, even more reluctant to speculate on, which is the oil price. Um, here it's in real dollars. Sorry, this is in dollars of the day. This is real dollars. And uh, it's been fluctuating up and down. This is averaged over a year. At the moment, the oil price is actually higher than here. It's up here. And uh, the possibility is that a high oil price obviously drives energy efficiency and plunges the world into recession. And we indeed may be on that downward slide. Now, you might say, well, that's, uh, that's good for climate change, less oil, less CO2. It is not, because the fear is that as the easy oil becomes more and more difficult to produce in the volumes that we desire, we switch to oil that is heavier, more difficult to produce, or we convert coal and other longer chain hydrocarbons into the lighter fuel oils that we need. So we have a switch not from coal to oil to gas to renewables, but from coal to oil to gas to back to coal to provide the fuels that we need. And so again, here is my own analysis. This is CO2 concentrations against time. The wiggly ones are what's actually been measured. This is, from an appropriate baseline, the contribution to that increase from oil, from gas, from coal. And then a prediction forward, again using this Hubbard analysis, on the contribution to an increase in CO2 possibly from producing oil, gas, and coal. And the real fear is coal here and other heavy hydro and, and heavy hydrocarbons. And uh, unabated, we move on to CO2 concentrations in about 500 and 50 parts per million range. I'm not a climate scientist, so I'm not going to say much more than that. But that almost certainly commits us to dangerous climate change. Now, again, this isn't a whether or not you like it argument. It's this is where the world is heading. Right? So if we're going to be practical, what are we going to do? And the one technology, I mean, and I say it is not 
the only thing we're going to do, but one thing we have to do, in my opinion, is carbon capture and storage. And I'm going to give a few slides of introduction because I'm speaking first, and then I'll talk more about storage. So what is carbon capture and storage? It's actually relatively straightforward. Conceptually, you take large point sources of CO2 emissions, principally power stations burning coal, oil or gas, or refineries, or cement works. You capture the CO2, and that's what Nick's going to talk about next. You transport it, and you inject it deep underground, and you store it deep underground. And that's what I'm going to talk about. Okay? So you inject it deep underground. It can be stored in an oil field, a gas field, saline aquifer, and also um, unminable coal seams. There are lots of numbers here on various estimates of storage capacity. As a rough approximation, it is considered that worldwide we have sufficient storage capacity. It's not a trivial exercise to store it, but broadly speaking, there is enough. So now I'm going to just talk a little bit about storage for the next 10 minutes or so, touch upon some of the research that we're doing here at Imperial, and then uh, round off and allow us to talk about the capture side. So, what about CO2? When you inject CO2 deep underground, it is at a much, much higher density than the gas you might encounter in the laboratory. Um, and in fact, it's a supercritical fluid. It has a density, less than water, but similar to most oils, but a very low viscosity. And now, some numbers. I'm going to do this. So current emissions, we produce about 30 gigatons of CO2 per year. That's everything. Okay. Um, if we inject most of these deep saline aquifers, so we're looking at storing about a kilometre or more underground, okay, into porous rock, we're looking at densities of around six to 700 kilograms per cubic metre, um, you can do the maths relatively easily, and we're looking at volumes of around 100 million cubic metres a day. Now, when I did my oil graph, I apologise, I did everything in barrels, that's how petroleum engineers operate. Um, there are about seven barrels to a uh, cubic metre, so it's about 700 million barrels a day. Now, current oil production, just as a basis of comparison, that's about 85 million barrels a day. Now, no one is suggesting that we're going to collect every single molecule of CO2 injected underground. It's part of the solution, not the only solution. But we can contribute one to two gigatons of carbon, right, which is about a quarter of that total. What we will be doing, as was said before, is we have a huge industry. We have an industry that is putting underground similar volumes of fluid that the present oil industry takes out of the ground. And the reason why those numbers are comparable, I think, is rather obvious. Right? Why they should be of the same order of magnitude. So it can contribute. It will be a huge business. It will deal with huge volumes of fluid. We have to be serious here. But it's not impossible. We already have an industry that is doing that. Now, I'm going to talk about North Sea storage and touch upon these things about, is it feasible? This is quite a busy looking graph, but Britain is uniquely placed to take a lead in CCS for two reasons. One is we produce a lot of CO2 from power stations, many of whom are on the east coast of Scotland and England, or near the east coast, and we have lots of storage potential offshore in the North Sea. Okay? But by being offshore, many of the public concerns go away. Now what this map is, and a very busy map it is indeed, is a map of oil in green and gas in red fields in the North Sea. Okay? And we're particularly fortunate to be endowed with these oil and gas fields. And I want to think about it more geologically, more conceptually. If we take just a cross section here, here's Scotland, here's Norway, 100, 100 kilometres across, and then look vertically down through there. This is quite a busy graph, but what we see is several kilometres of sedimentary rock. And what we're talking about here is mainly sandstones. So sand crushed together, basically. In the Middle East, the typical sedimentary rock is carbonates, which are crushed seashells in a sort of generic sense, crushed down, chemically altered. They have pore spaces. 
you have huge volumes. We're looking at volumes with depths here, over several kilometers in different units, and extensively over hundreds of kilometers. So you have these huge sedimentary basins. That's where that volume for storage comes from. We may only be using a small fraction of that volume, but the volume is there. Now, the main public concern is then, well, that's fine. You've got the volume, you inject the CO2, and is it actually going to stay underground? Because if it doesn't, the whole process is useless. Um, so here is just a schematic of what happens and what are the problems. Inject the CO2 into a saline aquifer. The cat rock here is relatively impermeable rock through which the CO2 cannot travel. The CO2 is less dense than brine, so it tends to rise upwards. Okay, so it's doing this. But as it moves, a number of things happen. It dissolves in the brine. That CO2-laden brine is denser, so it tends to sink, so it's moving downwards. At the back end, water moves in and traps the CO2 as pore space bubbles, <coughs> and I'm going to show a picture of that. And so this CO2 doesn't move. And then over very long time scales, perfectly natural process, is this brine with CO2 in it is acidic. It can react with the rock, and it can precipitate carbonates. And so carbonate limestones are a natural rock formed by this process. So unlike, say, nuclear waste, which is a real problem for a long time, the principal problem with CO2 is getting it in the ground and the pressure immediately and making sure it doesn't zoom off. But over time, it gets safer and safer. It moves into other phases where it is less likely to escape. So, now I'm going to touch upon, very briefly, on the sort of research that we do here at Imperial. It is a multi-scale <coughs> process. We need to analyse things at the micron scale where these pore space bubbles are. We do lots of experiments in the lab. I'm going to look at the Wolfson lab later on. And what we want to do is we want to model and design storage at the field scale, the scale of kilometers. So how do we do it? Just touching upon some of the things we do. We can image pieces of rock. This piece of rock, a couple of centimetres across. This is five millimetres across. We can image inside the rock using x-rays at a micron scale using benchtop instruments. We can use a synchrotron source, particularly bright source of x-rays, to zoom into the rock. And what do we see? Right, here we have, this is a piece of sandstone, about three millimetres across, imaged at a resolution of about 10 microns. The red are blobs of the non-witting phase, the CO2. Now, I haven't imaged the rock. I haven't imaged the water that's moved in and trapped it in these bubbles. I'm just showing you the bubbles. Right? They're trapped in the pore space, surrounded by rock. And so it's a nice image as you swirl around. But you can see, you get blobs here, but it's a few tens of microns across, just nestled between sand grains. You get more extensive blobs through many sand grains. But these are surrounded by rock and water. They're not moving. So the idea is we're going to design CO2 storage. So this, this CO2 is trapped as these bubbles. And you might say, mm, yeah, yeah, nice experiment, a bit flashy, but what's this all about? I'm a petroleum engineer. Okay. When we have an oil reservoir full of oil, we inject water to get the oil out, and we want to get all the oil out, but we leave half of it behind. Why? Because the oil's trapped in these blobs. So we know it happens when we don't want it to happen, so we're going to make it happen when we do want it to happen. So here are some experiments then that we've done in the lab recently. This is the saturation, the fraction of the pore space that has the trapped blobs in, against how much CO2 you put in there in the first place. You put in more CO2, you can trap more. And you get this curve, these are the results with CO2. These are the analogous results with oil. And what we're seeing is that we can have about a third of the pore space containing this trapped CO2. Right, so with that in mind, that's all at the small scale. How do we design this process at the large scale? So we run reservoir simulation studies looking at the injection of CO2 and that's safe storage. Okay, and this is going to be done in all storage sites, and it's something, again, that comes from the oil industry doing the same design for oil filling. 
Now this is quite a complex graph. I put it in, but I'm not going to describe it in detail. And if you want to know more details, that's what the briefing paper's about. Okay? So uh, you can read more if you get confused or ask me afterwards. But the idea is to design a safe storage um, mechanism. And one idea that we have is you inject the CO2 and water together. Together they move through the entire formation without the CO2 just rising up to the top. And then you follow it with water ejection. And what you have is right near the injection well, you've dissolved away all the CO2, so nothing can go back through the well. You've got all this trapped CO2 in the bubbles, and this is the mobile CO2, and this front actually catches up with this one, and it's a lovely piece of analytic analysis by one of my colleagues um, that's shown that this happens. And so you can then simulate this in three dimensions in your model of your reservoir, and you can show that you can design a process where essentially all that CO2 is trapped and trapped quickly. So you inject for about 20 years, inject some water, and then you walk away from that site with virtually everything trapped. And the stuff that isn't trapped doesn't inevitably escape, but the stuff that is won't. You can do exactly the same for an oil field. And actually this is rather interesting because jetting into a saline aquifer is fine, but it's all cost. You get nothing back. Jetting into an oil field, you know it's a safe place because oil and gas has been there for millions of years. You've got the infrastructure, you've got the expertise, you can sort of just get on and do it. And the beautiful thing is, CO2, remember it's a supercritical fluid, it mixes with the oil, it cleans the oil out of the pore space. Forget about blobs of oil being trapped, it all gets flushed out. It's fantastic for improved oil recovery. So what you do, you inject the CO2, you get an oil bank of the oil you've flushed out in front, and you produce more oil. Now it's not green oil, it's not helping climate change the oil production, but it's giving you some money to pay for the process and get this technology moving. So again, you can do this analytic um, idea in just in one dimension, pushing, pushing the CO2 to the oil to try and design the process, and then you can do the simulations. And what you find, rather counterintuitively, is you want a process where you maximise the amount of oil you produce, because you want to make money, but you want to maximise the amount of CO2 you keep underground. And this is... This has been done for 40 years in West Texas, using natural sources of CO2, that's from underground sources, to improve oil recovery. But what they do is they minimise the amount of CO2 they keep underground because they've got to pay for it. We want to maximise it, and counterintuitively, you maximise the amount of CO2 by injecting more water than you would traditionally. And the water, combining water and CO2 injection, the water traps the CO2 and keeps it underground. So... I'm aware we've got drinks outside and a couple more talks, so I'm going to be quite quick and wrap up. I firmly think that carbon capture and storage is a key technology, and in fact, I think it's absolutely essential. As I again keep saying, it's not that we do this and not other things, we do all the things, but if we ignore carbon capture and storage, we are going to have all our coal and oil and gas burnt and in the and the CO2 in the atmosphere. We need to deal with that, we need to deal with that now. Um, if it's going to make a difference, I don't think a few bijou pilot pl projects are going to be enough, right? We need to do it seriously. Um, we need to have an industry that is as big in terms of volumes of fluids come to oil industry. It is a major engineering challenge. It is going to be difficult. It does require some oomph and imagination, um, but we could do it. Our work, I'm not going to talk about capture because that comes later, work I'm involved in um, is to ensure that the CO2 stays underground. And there are some clear policy implications that we touch upon in the briefing paper. Um, we really need to get going on full-scale smokestack to storage projects. Okay? Um, we need to think about energy needs if we're doing CCS, because that changes the mix. And also enhanced oil recovery, um, I think, is something that we need to consider quite seriously. So, two more slides. Future work, what are we doing? More and more work on the experimental, understanding the physical and chemical processes very carefully. Fascinating scientific problems, and lots of the people here are working on them. Absolutely brilliant to do something that is both scientifically interesting and, of course, very useful. Um, I'm looking a bit more rigorously with the Energy Technologies Institute on exactly how much you can store. It's still, I wouldn't say a completely open question, but one that we need to refine. And really, most importantly as all, is actually doing this in the field and informing the policy debate. And uh, I'd like to thank 
many of my co-workers, you know, not really describing my work, I'm describing the work of, of many other people, and I know Frank Otara, uh, Yuki, uh, we have, and some are all in the audience uh, uh, tonight. And the last thing here is, yes, this is a Grantham Institute launch, also clearly jointly with uh, the Energy Futures Lab. It's lovely in to have that interface. And my work, and I'm not ashamed of it, I'm going to say it quite openly, our work here is funded by the oil industry. Uh, and we have significant funding from Shell and uh, Qatar Petroleum and the Qatar Science and Technology Park um, as part of a large programme on carbon capture and storage, specifically storage in carbonate residents. Okay, thank you very much.